Yes, good. We're good to go. Well, thank you, Gordon. I appreciate the invitation uh, to talk this morning. Uh, uh, my name is Andy Winant. Uh, I'm the extension specialist in vegetable pathology uh, over at Rutgers. And Gordon asked me to give you guys a, a disease update of some of the more important diseases of uh, we've been dealing with uh, around the region uh, for the past few years. All right, I wanna start off with talking about a bacterial leaf spot of, of pepper and tomato. As you know, it's very common in both the plantings. Uh, the bacteria is caused by the same genus of bacterium, uh, Xanthomonas. And once it's on your farm, it'll overwinter and infect the debris in the soil. So once you have it, uh, it can be problematic for, for many, many years. And really, uh, the best way to take care of this problem is to, you know, to do the long, good, decent crop rotations, uh, avoiding uh, uh, other susceptible hosts, uh, which some of them growers in, in South Jersey have a problem with uh, in most years because we grow so many bell and non-bell type peppers. As you can see, uh, these are typical symptoms on the leaf during the summertime, the irregular blotchiness, the brown spots. If you were to cut those lesions open, uh, you would see bacterial streaming. And anytime you get some sort of weather event, whether it be a hard rain, heavy winds and so forth, the bacteria can spread throughout the planting rather quickly. Uh, this is what bacterial leaf spot looks on young tomato transplants. And if you have bacterial leaf spot start in the greenhouse before those plants are put in the field, it can become a serious problem later on in the growing season. So you want to make sure you scout any of your transplants and so forth and look for these type of symptoms before you put them uh, out into the field. Uh, symptoms on fruit. Uh, very characteristics uh, on the left, you see a, an immature green tomato fruit. You see these large round scabby lesions. In most cases, they can get about as big as your pinky uh, nail on your hand. Uh, very distinct, uh, very cosmetic. Uh, and then on the, on the left, you see, I'm sorry, on the right, right you see uh, what we typically see on, on bell, bell and non-bell type peppers. Uh, we've done a lot of work uh, with bacterial leaf spot in New Jersey these past few summers, so I want to kind of give you an update of, of where the pathogen stands from a taxonomic standpoint. There are at least four species of xanthomonas involved in bacterial leaf spot in tomato and pepper. These include xanthomonas uvesicatoria, xanthomonas vesicatoria, xanthomonas gardenii, and xanthomonas perfrans. Uh, Fifteen years ago, uh, we just knew it as one species, uh, but as technologies improved and, and the science has improved, the ability to separate these pathogens out in the different species uh, has become more and more prevalent. In tomato, there's at least four races of BLS found. Uh, they often distinguish these as uh, T1 through T4, and you can see from the list of list above, uh, T1 type 1 uh, usually is diagnostic of uvesicatoria, type 2, vesicatoria, and so on. In bell peppers and non-bell peppers, it's a different story. There's at least uh, 11 known races of the pathogen found in bell and non-bell type peppers. You know, differential testing over the past 15 years in New Jersey, done by uh, Wes Klein and myself, uh, has confirmed that we have at least have found all 10 races in pepper in, in southern New Jersey. And if you go down south, uh, more down south, they have all 10 races and so forth uh, down in Florida and other areas where it's warmer. Uh, we're now collecting more information on these anthemonous species, and I'll talk about that uh, in a second. But really, it, we know what species are present as anthemonous are in your state or on your farm really depends on where you live uh, in the world. So in 2019 and 2020, uh, we selected a few farms that we knew had uh, bacterial leaf spot problems. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to identify what species of xanthomonas were present. Uh, and, and more importantly, as, as importantly, we wanted to determine if we could detect copper resistance. We've been spraying copper on uh, peppers and tomatoes you know, for, for many, many years now. And if you go to other parts of the country, uh, you will find copper resistance in these uh, bacterial species. But in New Jersey, over the past two summers, we have confirmed Xanthomonas uvesicatoria in both tomato and pepper. All right, it's one of the, one of the species that can infect both. 
But we also found some other interesting things as we were looking at other crops uh, and so forth. We also detected the Cinnamonas syringi uh, pathovar corintricola, uh, verifolata, and another Xanthomonas as well. We detected syringi corintricola, uh, which is a bacterial disease of carrot parsley parsnip. We also found that on tomato and pak choy in New Jersey. Pseudomonas verdeflava is a bacterial disease of tomato, melon, and eggplant, and many other crops. We found that in parsley during the past couple of seasons. And one other interesting bacteria we found was Xanthomonas arbarcola path of our pruni, which causes a bacterial least spot in peaches, but we also found that in tomato in the northern part of the state. So we found some interesting things uh, as we've done this screening over the past couple of summers. So what we did find is we, we know now that the Xanthomonas population uh, is very diverse in New Jersey, as I would expect it to be in other parts of the Mid-Atlantic region. You know, there's broad implications for understanding what species of bacterial leaf spot are present on your farm. You know, that many of these have the potential for being seed borne, which means more seed treatments will probably have to be done uh, in the future. You know, and for example, in the northern part of the state, uh, we have many uh, smaller roadside market farmers use the hot water seed treatment to help clean their seed prior to seeding in the spring. Some of you may be doing this yourself. Uh, I know in the past we've had workshops throughout the mid-Atlantic region. A lot of this equipment is available for you. Uh, so that's something you may want to look at. You know, some of these have multiple hosts. All right. And, you know, some, you know, and this is very early on, we don't have a lot of information, but, you know, this finding, we grow a lot of peaches in the state. So this pruni, which we found in, in peach, you know, if we can find that on tomato, this may have, you know, implications for those farmers in the northern part of the state that grow vegetables as well as tomato, I mean, peach and apple trees. So we need a lot more further understanding on this. All right, there is this potential for copper resistance. Uh, we've known for years that we probably have copper resistance in New Jersey, but uh, this is the first time since I've been here that we've been able to, to team up with some other colleagues on campus. We actually can do this testing uh, up in New Brunswick. When it comes to dealing with bacterial release spot, particularly on, on peppers, you know, Choosing the resistant cultivars is extremely important. As you know, Phytophthora is an extremely important disease in pepper and tomato in New Jersey. You know, we've relied on Phytophthora resistant tolerant bell pepper varieties for nearly 25 years now. But in the future, since we've detected all 10 races of the bacterial leaf spot in New Jersey, you know, our growers at least in the southern part of the state are really going to have to adopt these X10R varieties of bell peppers if they haven't already not because of the copper resistance issues and so forth. All right, you know, copper has been used for many, many decades to control bacterial leaf spot and other bacteria in vegetable production. As I said earlier, we, we've used it, we've suspected it, that we have resistance in New Jersey, <clears throat> excuse me, and resistance has been known at least on the eastern for, shore of Virginia for many, many years now. And we do know copper resistance has developed uh, in other regions. So we're gonna continue this survey over, over the next couple summers. Uh, we're gonna you know, expand it out to more farms. Uh, I could probably work with Gordon. Uh, if you have suspect copper resistance, or if you'd like to know what species are present on your farm in Delaware, we may be able to work something out where we could get samples from you and ship them up to our, our bacteriologist up on campus. All right, just as a review, you know, in New Jersey, we have at least all 10 races have been present. Uh, you know, many of your bell pepper cultivars now have resistance to one or more races of these pathogen. All right, so it's very important, you know, that you know what races of the pathogen you have on your farm, because if you're growing a bell pepper variety, that doesn't carry resistance to a certain race and you have that race, then that, you know, that cultivar is not gonna do you much help. But the easiest way to control BLS is with resistant cultivars. You know, some of our more traditional varieties such as Paladin, which we've used in New Jersey for the past 15, 20 years for the, it's Phytophthora resistance has no resistance to bacterial leaf spot. 
All right, some of our newer cultivars, such as 18, 19, has resistance to races one through five. Uh, a turn, the cultivar Turnpike, which is developed by Seminus, has resistance to races one through five and seven through nine, but also has uh, Pythophora tolerance. All right, and that's very important. Uh, so you can check out the 2020, 2021 commercial vegetable recommendations guide to see the list of, of pepper varieties that uh, we recommend. Unfortunately, there are very few non-bell types that carry, uh, you know, any sort of resistance packages uh, uh, to bacterial leaf spot. All right, just to give you an example uh, of what we've, of the bell peppers we grow in New Jersey, you know, at the top, you know, starting from one of our older varieties, which is Paladin, we used for many, many years uh, because it has strong resistance to Phytophthora. It has no resistance to bacterial release spot. What's interesting in the past two years at our research farm here in South Jersey, if we plant Paladin in the field, it becomes so overrun with bacterial release spot early in the summer that we've gotten no yield off of it. Some of these other varieties, which have been out for quite a while, so this Aristotle Declaration and Revolution has pretty high tolerances to Phytophthora, and those varieties carry resistance to races one, two, and three, or races one, two, three, and or five uh, resist uh, for bite BLS. There's Archimedes 18, 19, uh, Intruder, and if you go back, look at the bottom sides of the list, one of the varieties we've been looking at over the past few years is Playmaker. It has good levels of tolerance to Phytophthora, but it also has resistance to rates of zero through 10 of the bacterial leaf spot pathogen. So in the next few years, there's gonna be a dramatic shift because bacterial leaf spot has become so problematic of our growers in South Jersey uh, of choosing these varieties that has this X10R resistance, but also has good Phytophthora tolerance and or resistance. You know, from a control standpoint, as I talked about earlier, there's the hot water sea treatment. There's also Clorox treatments, uh, which some of you may be doing. Uh, the difference between the two is the Clorox treatment, you know, acts as a disinfectant. It'll kill any bacteria on the seed coat uh, versus the hot water seed treatment, which will kill any bacteria present on the seed coat as well as any bacteria uh, within the seed. All right, with bell peppers, at least, it's choosing those varieties that carry resistance with the multiple races of the pathogen. Uh, from a cultural standpoint, again, I know it's, it's hard sometimes, but, it, you know, avoiding working in the field when the foliage is wet, uh, especially during harvesting and tying, because the workers can easily spread the bacteria up and down the rows. And if you have an, an infected field, you want to make sure you work in the most affected blocks last. So you avoid bringing or spreading bacteria, uh, spreading the bacteria to otherwise healthy fields. Again, knowing that you don't have copper resistance, uh, we would recommend still using copper. Uh, but if you do have a copper resistant population on your farm, again, it's good to be finding other alternatives to copper because if your bacterial release spot population becomes resistant, no amount of copper is going to help mitigate that problem. Remember, some of you in, in the field may be using disinfectants at certain times during the summer if you're not spraying coppers per se. And just remember that these, these products always only work with what they come into contact with on the foliage. I'm going to switch now uh, to cucurbit downy mildew. Uh, as, as many of you know, downy mildew of cucurbits has become a significant problem uh, throughout the United States uh, since 2004. Traditionally, it's naturally thought that it's brought up on weather patterns from the southern areas of the country. You know, if we look at the first reports of cucurbit downy mildew, at least in New Jersey over the past 16 years, uh, and just based on when it shows up, you know, over the past 15 years, 6% of this time it's been detected in May. 25% uh, of the time it's been first detected in June, 50% in July, and 19% as late as August. Uh, but in general, if you just look at the numbers, you know, 75% of the time, it's most likely going to show up in our area of the country sometime in June or July. Uh, but more importantly, over the past 10 years, it's always showed up on cucumber first. 
Our assumption is that it does not overwinter in the northern regions of the country because the pathogen needs a living host to survive. At least in Europe, over the past few, few years, the pathogen ha has been shown to produce oospores in laboratory settings, which would allow it to overwinter possibly in our soils, but their role and presence, at least in our part of the country, are still not understood. Uh, in the past five years, uh, things have changed dramatically. There's at least two lineages or clads of cucurbit downy mildew. Clad two is mostly found on cucumber, uh, particularly in northern states. Clad one is mostly found on squash, watermelon, and pumpkin. At least in the southern part of the country, both mating types are present. All right, if both mating types are present, this would allow uh, the cucurbit downy mildew population to reproduce sexually, you know, in overwinter because of the production of oospores. But again, at this point in time, uh, we don't know if the cucurbit downy mildew population can actually survive in the northern soils and or if both, you know, clades are present, which allow it to do so through reproduction, right? In general, in the past, you know, it, at least at some point in the summer, all of our cucurbit crops were affected by cucurbit downy mildew by the end of the season. What was different was, was when each became infected. And this really changed around 2009, I would say, you know, because since then it's always shown up on cucumber first. This may suggest, at least in our region, you know, uh, clade two is, you know, the predominant portion of the population, okay. You know, is it coming up from the south? We know we got the CDM pipe web casting forecast. We know it comes up on weather. Uh, but, you know, what percentage or what part of that population, you know, why it's, you know, why that just clay two is showing up and causing more problems than clay one? Uh, there's a lot of unknowns there. So, what we need to do is really need to carefully monitor uh, our crops each year. Uh, to determine, you know, which ones become infected when, so we can kind of have an idea of, of what to expect in, in future years. You know, these shifts in pathogen, pathogen populations are not uncommon. Uh, these broad shifts, you know, in late blight, for example, is a good example where the many types of the Phytophthora and Piston pathogens or the genotypes tend to change or shift from year to year uh, or over a number of years. What's also new in the past couple of years is at least from North Carolina State University shows that the fungicide efficacy may depend on what clades are present in your area. As I said, clade two has, has been mostly found on cucumber in our region over the past few years, uh, less so uh, clade one, which you would typically find on squash and watermelon. You know, research, research suggests that isolates of clade two which is found on Cuber become become resistant to specific fungicides sooner. All right, so that's something you're going to have to pay attention to. If you're growing cucumber and or other cucumber crops, you want to pay attention to your fungicide efficacy. All right, most of our cucumber varieties are resistant to clade one, but there's no resistance to clade two. And for pickling cucumber varieties, you know, Citadel, and Peacemaker are tolerant to clade two isolates. And then on the flip side, you know, from the slicing varieties, uh, the number lines there are tolerant to clade two isolates as well. So you need to pay attention again, you know, to the population, what crops you're seeing the dining middle on, and also your fungicide efficacy, because you want to be able to monitor or follow if, if fungicide resistance is developing. Uh, that was a lot to take in. I'm going to switch over. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me at the end of the talk or, or in the chat. I'll try to get to them, uh, you know, at, at the end of the presentation. Uh, one other pathogen we've been dealing with uh, a lot over the past five, six, seven years in New Jersey is pepper anthracnose. Pepper anthracnose has basically become more problematic than Phytophthora in the southern part of the state. Uh, more growers fear anthracnose than they do Phytophthora these days. Uh, so hopefully you're, you're not seeing on th this on your farm yet, but if you do, your management strategies for anthracnose are going to change 
dramatically. Uh, you know, for the past 10 years, I've done a number of fungicide trials looking to control anthracnose and, and pepper crops. You can control it, but you need to start your fungicides early. And then you're gonna need to be on a weekly spray program. Uh, basically from the early flower fruit set until you're done with that block. Okay, again, from the table you can see here, again, I have my field uh, probably has more anthracnose in it than any other field in New Jersey, which, which I would want. Uh, you know, from this trial here on the untreated control, where we don't spray for uh, anthracnose at all. You know, in any given year, I'll have 80 to 100% of the fruit I pull from those plots will be infected with anthracnose. But again, control is possible. Is 100% control possible? Probably not, but you can significantly reduce it. You know, simply by spraying, again, chlorothalonil, Bravo. You know, we go from 80% infection down to 60% infection just with a weekly Bravo application, as well as using any of the FRAC code 11 fungicides during the production season. Again, just below Bravo, and this we rotated Bravo with Mervis Prime, Bravo with Cabriel, and Bravo with Quadris. Again, you can we can get very good control of anthracnose, but you're gonna have to spray for it. Moving on to cucurbit powdery mildew. You know, in the past, if you go back to the old literature, powdery mildew and cucurbits was caused by two different species, uh, uh, two different fungi. Uh, and you put his xanthi, which is formerly Sparasica uh, foliginae, as well as Galidomyces chicoriaceum, okay, which is formerly known as Erysiphe. All right, with the former being more reported uh, in the US and worldwide. You know, in general, Erysiphe was more commonly found in cooler weather, where uh, Podosphera preferred hotter weather, okay. But recent research, you know, out of Cornell and other areas, uh, when they looked at the population across the United States, they basically found that 100% of the, of the powdery mildew species, at least on the East Coast, was uh, Podosphera xanthi. So in the case of powdery mildew, where the, the population seems to be getting, getting, you know, less diverse, the population, uh, of cucurbit downy mildew seems to be changing or getting more diverse. And that's very important uh, that you understand that. You know, just like cucurbit downy mildew, powdery mildew is an novel like a parasite, which means in, in the fall when our cucurbit crops freeze out, the pathogen would simply die out with the host. But powdery mildew can produce overwintering structures called chasmothesia. All right, I'll show you a picture of those in a second. Uh, the production of these overrunning instructions shows that the pathogen is reproducing sexually, which can give rise to the genetic diversity within CPM population, which also can lead to differences in virulences, as well as most importantly, fungicide resistance development. As I said a second ago, it can produce these overwintering bodies. And I've been in New Jersey uh, for about 16 years now, and I've done a number of cucurbit powdery mildew trials over the year. And I think I've probably seen uh, these these overwintering spores produced twice, very late in the fall. And what you're looking for are these little black dots. Typically, they're produced on the undersides of leaves within the white powdery mildew spots on the lesion. Okay. Uh, so when you're scouting in the fall, when you're almost done with the crop, you know whether it's a pumpkin crop would probably be the easiest, or another cucurbit crop. You want to make sure you, you pay attention uh, to what you're seeing on the least surface. You know, diagnostically, these are these little black dots. Actually, and if you look up, you know, up and very close, you know, they're circular. They produce these ASCO spores. Uh, this dark, you know, black structure, you know, will survive in the soil on an infested debris. And they also produce these appendages, which are very ornate. And that's how you tell the different species of, of powdery mildew by these appendages they produce on these Clystothesia. So I would encourage you guys to scout for these. Uh, it's information we'll be looking for in the future. Uh, because we want to know, you know, if the powdery mildew pathogen is surviving more or less in our region. The, the one thing I want to bring up is I had I was on a call early this fall, and we look at fungicide resistance development in our area. 
as well as they look at fungicide resistance to powder mildew in other areas. And some of the information that came out of Florida uh, from this previous talk I saw is they're not, they're not seeing the types of fungicide resistance develop the specific fungicides in Florida that we're seeing develop in our region. So this may mean that we may have, you know, some overwintering of the cucurbit powdery mildew fungus in our area. But in general, you know, just like CDM, we expect, you know, powdery mildew to come up the East Coast as cucurbit crops are planted, you know, in the spring and typically, you know, by midsummer, the pathogens here. You know, the fungicides that have been used to control path the pathogen in the southern regions <coughs> may greatly impact our efficacy. So our control strategies in our region may be different than other areas of the country. Importantly, there are a number of cucurbit crops now with very good genetic resistance to cucurbit powdery mildew. And I hope when you go through our recommendations guide, uh, just like with Phytophthora, and cucurbit downy mildew, you look for those crops that have good genetic resistance. It doesn't mean that the pathogen's not going to infect that crop, but those varieties may help delay the onset of the disease. Importantly, you know, most of our focus over the past few years has been with cucurbit downy mildew. All right, so I'm encouraging you not to give up your cucurbit powdery mildew programs. Just remember that the same fungicides used to control Cucurbit downy mildew won't control cucurbit powdery mildew. And more importantly, when it comes to powdery mildew control, again, the same fungicides that you can use to control powdery mildew will also help mitigate anthracnose, gummy stemmy blight, and plectosporium blight. Okay, we've seen an increased instances of plectosporium blight in our state. And I have to imagine that some of this is just because we're so focused on cucurbit downy mildew control that in some cases our growers have probably lacked the cucurbit powdery mildew control. And just remember that this, for example, the strobe learn fungicides, the frac code 11 fungicides, which we typically don't recommend for powdery mildew control anymore because of resistance issues, those fungicides still may be useful for some of these other pathogens that may become problematic and cucurbit crops, such as anthracnose and plectosporium blight. So if you haven't done this in the past couple of years, you, you really need to reevaluate your season law control programs. This is especially important if you've been strictly focused on trying to control cucurbit downy mildew over the past few years. Again, if you go through our recommendations guide, you can see what we recommend for each. And again, our resistance, uh, our resistance, look at our fungicide resistance testing, you know, for resistance and powdery mildew is going to continue. Megmagrath does a lot of this on the East uh, the Long Island each year. Uh, but this trial goes back to 2019, as, as you probably heard, our research programs in 2020, 2020 were significantly reduced because of the COVID issues. But again, if, if you look at, at our control here, you know, simply looking at the AUDPC values uh, for control. Again, the higher the number, the less efficacy or control you, you get. Again, looking at pristine by itself, Tarina by itself, again, we're not getting very good control, uh, particularly with, with, again, pristine's a frac code 11 point aside, which I would expect. Trino, uh, which we've recommended highly over these past few years, it seems to be breaking down in its efficacy. So that's if you've been relying on Trino for the past few years in your program, uh, you may want to make look at other fungicides. Some of these other rotations where we rotated Trino with Vivando and Rally, you get much better control. And some of these other products, uh, Maravis Prime, Luna Experience, Vivando by itself, again, very good very good control. And again, in all the rotation of these different fungicides from different frac codes, you can get very good control of cucurbit powdery mildew. So if you haven't looked at some of these newer products in the past few years, and you relied on Torino, for example, or you still relying on frac code 11 fungicides, you want to make sure you look at the newer, newer fungicides with uh, different modes of action. One thing I did in 2019, which I wasn't allowed to do in 2020, uh, 
is I wanted to, to evaluate the use of, uh, or the rotations of uh, high risk fungicides with low risk fungicides. And I had six different fungicide programs here. Uh, I'm trying not to make this complicated, but if you look at the far left of the table, for example, in this first program, I applied one high risk fungicide once, which is Terreno, and then I followed it by five weekly applications of Bravo. I looked at Bravo simply by itself, where I had no high risk fungicides. And then I looked at two high risk fungicides in week one and two, followed by four Bravo applications. Then the first, again, going down the column, three hit high risk fungicides, followed by three Bravo applications, five high risk fungicides with a single application of Bravo at the end of the season, and six high risk fungicides with no protectant type fungicides in the program. And then finally, you know, the best program here in this case were, was where I applied, again, not significantly different, uh, but where I applied four high risk fungicides followed by two low risk fungicides. And one of the other purposes of this trial was because the use of Bravo uh, during flowering, the flowering time of cucurbits is, is kind of come over under some scrutiny over the past few years because of, of the impacts it may have on, on bee populations. So again, it's not surprising where I use, you know, fungicides with uh, different modes of action. I got better control fungicides with translaminar activity, again, better control than just simply applying Bravo by itself. And that's not terribly surprising. But the key here is the other thing I did is I waited for as long as possible to start my first application. Okay, so again, this is the, the disease progress curves throughout the summer. Again, August 22nd was vine tip. Again, I didn't have any powdery mildew in the field, but that's when I initiated my first program. And then you can see this, the six asterisks here in my rating base. Again, you know, where I didn't apply any fungicides, as you might expect, I got the most powdery mildew where I applied, you know, one high risk fungicide early on in the season, followed by you know, five Bravos, again, powdery mildew increased, which I would expect. And then I got better control as I pushed the high risk fungicides later into the season. So one of the points I wanna make here is, and I, I think I'm running out of time. Yeah. yeah, Andy, we need to move on soon. Okay, okay. I'm gonna finish with this point here. You know, if we have fungicides, multiple fungicides from different modes of action, in this case, you know, for cucurbit powdery mildew, we have we recommend fungicides from U06, uh, frac code 3, 7, 11, and 13. The idea here is that, you know, we can use these, you know, in long rotations during the season. So if we apply a frac code 3 fungicide in week two, we can rotate it the next week with the frac code 11, 7, then 11, 13. But basically, we have five weeks before the an application of the same fungicide with the same mode of action. All right. So where we have these fungicides available, you want to make sure you rotate those chemistries, you know, during the season. But you also want to make sure you rotate them as far apart within the season. And I think we we can improve our powdery motor control. We can stay within limitations on the label, and we might get away with with dealing with using some of these other protectant fungicides which may cause issues in the season. Am I saying giving up using Bravo? No, because it, it has efficacy against other pathogens. But again, do, in doing so, you know, we can reduce some of our costs as well as we can also reduce some of our risk if we rotate fungicides with different modes of actions as much as possible. All right, I'll wrap up there again, just quickly. The 2021 production guide is available. As you know, we went to a two-year cycle last year. So if you need a guide, uh, you can talk to your county office or your acceptance agent to get one from last year. Uh, we will have a new guide available for 2022 and 2023. All right, you can get these the current guide for free from off the web or you can you know purchase it from a county office but we will be making a critical update sheets to you guys that will be available free for any significant changes that we need to include to give to you guys for this upcoming season it will be available for free and it will be available for 
uh, online as well. Uh, and that's all I have, Gordon. All right, thank you much, Andy.